All right, perfect. Okay, and I'm just gonna pull up. Welcome everyone to the August 15th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. I'm calling the meeting to order at 2.04 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And uh, Jennifer did have to leave us today. And I know that um, Alexis will not be able to join us for the next couple of meetings. She made me aware of that. So we'll certainly miss her. I'm going to do a quick sound check, and then we have lots of guests who are joining us this morning who I'm going to ask Pamela to help me to bring into the room. Um, and Pamela, just so you know, everyone except for LM um, and MK uh, using those initials, everyone else should be brought into the room. Um, and so first, Deborah, can you hear and be heard? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. All right. All right. And Dr. Rhodes? Yes, I can hear. Okay, we can hear you as well. And Yvonne? Yes, I can hear. And we can see you now. <laughs> um, and Dr. Shabazz? Okay, well, we could hear him a second ago so speaking in Spanish, so hopefully um, as we're bringing folks into the room here. And for our special guests from the League of Women Voters Racial Justice Committee, if you'd like to put your camera on, that would be fantastic. If you're in a position where you um, aren't able to, that's okay too. It's nice to see all your faces. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make sure that, that you, you can all be heard as well in just a moment. All right. Dr. Shabazz, what do you have behind you? So this is the uh, Plaza of Simon de Bolivar in Bogota, Colombia. This is a scene from the uh, presidential inauguration of last week. Yeah, I'm very, very excited to hear more about it. <laughs> uh, okay, I think we've brought everyone in. Thank you, Pamela. So we have, as I said, some guests joining us today um, for a meet and greet. Uh, we wanted to, uh, many of us know each other from different, you know, aspects um, in the community, but we thought as one committee to another committee who is working on racial justice, um, we could bring us together and have an opportunity just to say hello and um, introduce ourselves and then maybe have some discussion about what we're doing as a committee uh, in the coming months and what you all are doing and then how we might be able to support each other in, in our shared work. Um, and I do want to say that the Racial Justice Committee of the League has been um, an integral committee in moving the community along with respect to racial justice issues um, and uh, has um, prior to reparations for Amherst, putting out a report uh, which sort of started the ball rolling with the reparations work, the leagues, I think it was this committee that um, put forward a really, really fantastic report that's available on their website. It's available also, I believe, on our AHRA uh, resources page. If it's not, it should be. Um, and it provided a lot of data and information and also really helped the community to see how 
uh, lacking in racial data there was and how challenging it was to get that data. So, um, and of course, um, the Racial Justice Committee has been working um, to support the foundational um, components of the DEI and Crest Department coming into fruition. Um, most recently held a welcome uh, celebration at Groff Park to welcome Pamela and Earl, and also has a network um, where they have sort of organized all of the people in the community that are working on these issues to get together. And so I'll let Marcy, who is the chair of that committee, say a little bit more. But Marcy, I was thinking that we could each just go around and maybe say our name and what brings us to the work briefly or whatever kind of comes in the moment. Um, but I'll pass it over to you, Marcy, and you can start if you'd like. So Michelle, do you want me to then call on my co committee members? Sure, that'd be Our great. Committee members. Um, okay, so I think you all know me. I'm Marcy Sklove. I've been in town for a long time. Um, I've been chairing this committee. Uh, we started in the spring, early summer of 2020 um, as, a, as a member of uh, the League of Women Voters. It, used to be local action committee and then morphed into social justice committee and now is specifically addressing racial justice um, issues mostly in town but our charge is sort of twofold one is looking at town work um, and where we can be helpful in supporting the work and also in promoting good communication um, and, you know, just better relationships. Um, and also internally with the league, we have a charge to educate and uh, bring the league closer to um, the desires of the whole state and national League of Women Voters, which is since really for the last two years, very much uh, looking at almost everything through the lens of DEI. So our charge is to help um, bring the local league members along in that as well. Um, so that's sort of a, a beginning of who I am. Um, I'll just go around from my screen. Uh, Renee, I see you, do you wanna say hello? You're muted. Everybody needs to remember. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Renee Moss, um, and um, I know several several of you on the screen. I have been in Amherst since 1981, and for 32 years, I was the director of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County and chaired the Amherst Human Services Network as well. Um, and now I am on the leadership of the Sojourner Truth for Social Change Leadership. I joined this committee, the Racial Justice Committee of the League of Women Voters, I believe about two years ago. And um, it, 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 I, it's my passion, it's my heart, it's where I wanna be, it's the kind of work I wanna be doing. And I um, thank you for having us here today. Um, Ash? Again, muted, yeah. Yeah, unmute, I know. <laughs> the most commonly heard thing on Zoom. Uh, really good to see you all. <laughs> and I think I know all of you except for Yvonne, and it's uh, good to meet you, Yvonne, uh, even if virtually. Um, I, uh, I've been in Amherst for about 20 years now, but um, most of my work has actually taken me. Hello. <laughs> most of my work has taken me uh, to... Uh, to, I, I, I specialize in international education. I'm an adjunct faculty member at uh, a professor at uh, the Center for International Education at UMass, and much of my work has taken me to work in education in Africa over many, many years. And that's my passion. But my passion is also now the education of ourselves in this country to uh, relearn our, our lost history. Um, our, our neglected history and to bring that to bear on a better understanding of how 
uh, pub public policy can begin to change, uh, and especially starting locally, uh, right here in town. And uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, to be here and, uh, and 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 to be a part of a process of, of of learning how we can do a much much better job about our relationships and our policies and our local justice and our local equity. A lot to be done. Martha? Pass. <laughs> Hi, I'm Martha Hanner, and I moved to Amherst after retiring, so that's been 15 or 18 years ago by now. I'm an astronomer by training and joined this committee two years ago, and I feel I've learned a lot in these two years, uh, both about the larger issues and then about our community and the particular challenges here. And I uh, worked on that report that you referred to with, with Ash and we were struck really by the data that are lacking. You know, there's, there's really not even a basic census of the black community here in Amherst. And, and we're really glad that, that you folks are undertaking that uh, because that's, you know, that's an important basis to, to start with. So uh, thank you for hosting the meeting and we look forward to working together in the future. Thank you, Martha. Marcy, before you um, move, is Bonnie? Is yes. It? Okay. Um, if Pamela, if you could bring Bonnie in, that would be wonderful. Go on. Sorry, Marcy. Oh, sure. Sure. May? Hello, everyone. Uh, I can't, can't see everyone who's here, but maybe the screens are off, the cameras are off. Um, I'm Meg Gage. I live in North Amherst, almost next door to Michelle, not quite, District 1. Um, I am retired from 35-year career in philanthropy, uh, working uh, primarily on uh, democracy and human rights, particularly focusing on voting rights, uh, gerrymandering, and things like that. Uh, and uh, I have been involved in this work a long time. I don't need to go through the details. I really appreciate being on the Racial Justice Committee and a particular contribution that I've made is sharing what I've learned over the 35 years of building a multiracial diverse organizations, particularly challenging the field of philanthropy, which is largely white. <clears throat> and. Um, drafted the first draft of the memo we wrote to the town on uh, strategies for and, and tools for creating more diverse uh, committees and staff. And uh, I'd say that's an area where I have been able to contribute because of oh, my work. <laughs> Over. Thank you. And I, oh, I should say I have a meeting at, at three, not home. So I'll have to either get on my phone and be weird or just leave at about 10 minutes to three. We might, we might be done by then, I think, anyway. Yeah. Um, thank you, Meg. Jeff, and then Bonnie. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Gold. I hold the uh, distinction of being the most recent member of the um, League of Women Voters Racial Justice Committee. Um, and uh, that's of about a month's duration, maybe six weeks, I don't know, something like that. So I, I'm, the, I'm the baby of the group. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I live on the Amherst Pelham line, uh, literally uh, across the street is, um, is Amherst. I can about five feet across the road and I live in Pelham. Um, but um, uh, I'm a mostly retired clinical psychologist. Uh, for the last 25 years, I've worked with uh, traumatized adolescents, children and their families in Springfield and, and Pittsfield mostly. Um, and um, and uh, an, another hat that some of you probably know that I wear is that I'm the co-chair of the Reparations Committee of the Jewish Community of Amherst. We put together the Stolen Beam um, uh, series, which um, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say tomorrow registration will be opening for that course at the Jones Library. So uh, we're very, very excited about doing this um, with uh, the co-sponsorship of the AHRA and the Jones Library. And um, we're really hoping that it's going to 
be a big, big success. So um, welcome. And I know some of you, I don't know all of you, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Jeff. Bonnie, do you wanna turn your camera on too, if you can? And you're muted. Do you wanna just introduce yourself briefly? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Bonnie Isman, and I'm sorry I'm late. I got involved in an ongoing issue with the book sale, so I'm now back fully on this racial justice topic, and I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody. Um, it's an important mission you folks have, and I think it's really great to have a joint meeting together. Thank you so much. Thanks. So, Michelle, do you want to have introductions with your committee, and then I have a few things I'd like to say, just background about the league. Absolutely. That would be fantastic. Um, oh, before that, I just made a note. There are three more members of our committee who couldn't make it today. Uh, David Williams, um, Andrea Battle, and Rebecca Fricka. And they are all longtime members of our committee. So yeah. sorry, they're not here. I'm glad you mentioned that. I had made a note for you from our email exchange to mention that. So yeah, I'm glad that um, you mentioned it and maybe the next time they'll be able to join us. Um, so let's start uh, by doing some introductions here. And Dr. Rhodes, can we start with you? You're first on my, so I'm gonna start with you and then we'll go around and just a brief, brief introduction. Yeah, my name is Irv Rhodes and obviously I'm a member of this committee. I've been in Amherst for a long time. I'm also on the uh, school committee, and I'm also on the downtown Amherst Foundation Committee, and I'm a committee member of the United Way of Franklin Hampshire. And as a member of that group, I sat on their DEI uh, committee. You're busy. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife says. <laughs> Oh, well, we're very grateful to have you on this committee. <laughs> um, Ms. Bridges. <laughs> Gotta find that unmute button. <laughs> it's there somewhere. <laughs> You're looking, Deborah's there. I know, dear. Hi, I know. Um, a lot of you on the committee, Meg, <laughs> Marcy, and Ash. Um, I just got on the reparations committee, um, thanks to Michelle. Um, and I was very, very interested in being on this committee, as well as yours. <laughs> we haven't gotten around to that one yet, but we will. Okay. But being um, seventh generation in Amherst, um, I thought I could contribute a lot to reparations. Um, first few, just listening a whole lot and putting in two cents, but um, I'm very happy to be a part of it and a part of the town and the committee coming back. And we are very grateful that you joined us. This is, I think, <laughs> your third or fourth meeting now. I was, I was thinking about that. Is it third? You know, third, third. yeah. <laughs> well, one of them I remember didn't happen. I think <laughs> your first one. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Dr. Shabazz, are you available? Yes, yeah, Milkar Shabazz. I um, serve on this uh, committee as well and um, have been awakened to the issue of black reparations since uh, 1980 as a, as a political concern, but uh, aware of the pains and harms uh, really throughout my life, learning from my grandmother of how my grandfather was uh, white capped. That's where I learned the term white capped um, because he was working uh, as a private entrepreneur uh, and becoming too successful. And so was visited by people in white caps, uh, Ku Klux Klan's to, uh, to stop his business uh, or um, the next visit would be the end of his life. Um, I have also uh, was then made aware as a child as well of a race riot in my hometown of Beaumont, Texas in 1943, where my family personally lost capital 
as a result of whites rioting uh, in that uh, in that city in 1943. Um, so that's uh, some of the background that I bring to this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And Yvonne. Hi, I know a bunch of people here, Meg and Renee. Um, yeah, nice to see you. Uh, I'm also a member of this committee, very proud to serve. I've been in Amherst since the 1980s. I moved here to go to college. I ended up working at the University of Massachusetts with Roberta Uno at New World Theater. So a lot of my background is the arts, um, social justice and equity um, uh, within the arts. Um, I worked at the uh, UMass Fine Arts Center for 30 years. Um, doing a lot of that as well as music presenting, arts presenting, um, outdoor festivals, and doing um, engagement and outreach work with the local communities in Springfield, um, Holyoke, Greenfield, um, all around Western Massachusetts. So um, a lot of that kind of work. Um, I've been on the this committee, I think this is our second tour. We got um, re-upped <laughs> recently. And I also served six years as the chair of the Amherst Local Cultural Council. So that's um, some of my committee experience. Um, yeah, I worked I, on I, Amherst, Amherst Cinema. I did serve on the Amherst <laughs> Cinema Committee. Thank you. Yes, I did. Um, and a few, probably a bunch of other committees I can't remember um, back in the day. But um, just to keep things moving, uh, um, I have a particular interest in um, housing equity for um, people of color. I think it's the best way for folks to build wealth. And I've actually had a couple of instances in my personal life where I or my family was denied um, uh, access to housing or to um, purchasing housing or loans because of racism. So that's my particular reason for joining the committee. I really wanna see that be a reality for um, reparations for folks who live in Amherst. Thank you, Yvonne. And I will say um, we are missing two members today, Alexis Reed and uh, Hala Heather Lord, who many of you probably know both of those folks. Um, Alexis works at Amherst Media, um, so you may know her if you haven't seen her through there. She sets up every town council meeting. <laughs> She's behind the scenes there. So, um, and I think many of you know Heather. And so I'm sorry they can't be with us today, but you're missing two, I think, and we're missing two. So <laughs> we'll have to, that means we'll have we're to. We're missing three. Ah, oh, three. Okay. <laughs> Um, and also, Pamela, would you, um, I know everybody knows you, but just to. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm Pamela Young, the DEI director. I've had the pleasure of being invited to address the equity group for the League of Women Voters. So they've had a chance to hear my story um, quite a bit. And uh, obviously, I'm a staff liaison to this group with Jen Moyston. So. Yeah, and Jennifer is, I think some of you heard, had to um, take care of some personal matters right at the beginning of the meeting. Um, Ms. Bridges, I see your hand is raised. I, I think when I was saying in the beginning, I totally forgot to add on that <laughs> for those of you that don't know me, that I do also do the tours of the Civil War tablets and uh, do the stories about that and um, also we have an exhibit, the um, Ancestral Bridges. Um, we have an exhibit in the museum next to the library with, um, it's a beautiful pictorial exhibit of the black families that were in Amherst from the 1800s and before. So mm -hmm. sorry, I forgot to just put that in there. But just so the people who don't know me know also that's the other part of what I do. So, and that's in the bank center uh, downstairs, the um, um, Civil War plaques tablet. So if you get a chance, please come and visit. Ash knows all about that. He's here. He's there every day with me. He always comes and says hello. So, 
Ms. Bridges, would you say the hours um, for the Civil War tablets and also is the History Museum, if you didn't catch that on Juneteenth weekend, it is quite phenomenal. Um, and so wondering if that's open to the public right now? Actually, yes, I was there last Saturday, this past Saturday. I am actually gonna be there every Saturday for two hours and it's going to stay in there until they close down for the winter. Awesome. So that's a great thing. and. What I do is I do the tours downstairs, which they call the poll room in um, the, the uh, bank center. And I'm there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 10 to three. Hmm. And um, I'll, I do the tours. I'm waiting, hopefully September. Um, I spoke to Sarah Barr at Amherst College. She's going to be bringing um, hopefully uh, students and faculty there. Um, so it, uh, hopefully it'll be stepping up in September if, if the, the dreaded COVID doesn't mm. stop things in September again, let's, from my mouth to God's ears, um, but I, I'm happy to, to know that they're going to keep that exhibit in the museum right up until probably November, so. That's awesome. And, it, and it's always nice to have someone there like myself who's um, seven generations Amherst. And I can, you know, I have stories. It's, it's sometimes hard. You just look at pictures and you don't know. But when somebody's actually telling you, my grandfather told me this story, my uncle told me this story, um, it brings it to life. Because, you know, when you're an ancestor, it's, it's easy to say, you know, I sat on my grandfather's lap and he told me what he went through with um, racism and, you know, and, and I myself had, have gone through something, you know, teachers saying things in fourth grade, you know, like how does it feel to be a, a, a little black girl? How does it feel to be a slave? That my fourth grade teacher said to me. So I know what the harm is and, reason another reason I'm on this committee is I don't want to see that happening to the kids now so whatever we can do to stop that that's an, another reason I'm all for all these committees so thank you thank you Miss Bridges you're welcome um yeah so Marcy I think you wanted to uh, make some comments and then I thought after that we could open it up um, for five or 10 minutes just for other members on either committee to make comments or um, I wanted to share a little bit about what we'll be doing and how we might be able to work together um, with that. So I will pass it to you though, go ahead. Okay, thanks Michelle. Um, yeah, so there's a few things I wanna just update you all on. Um, at our last meeting, we agreed that um, we're going to shift gears a little bit in our in our programming coming up in the future. Um, we've been talking to your committee about co-sponsoring uh, a book group to read the Darity Mullen book, and um, we decided after you know, whatever happened between your committee and our committee and working with the steering committee. <clears throat> um, we, we have decided that that isn't the best choice of a book for us to start um, a, a reading group on reparations. Uh, and this is for the public, but mostly for league members. As I said, that's part of our charge is to educate league members. And instead, we are exploring the idea of using the stolen beam um, curriculum in a different fashion within the league itself. Um, so the way the league works, which <laughs> is both a blessing and a curse, and um, kind of, you know, a lot of hoops for us to jump through, but also is part of the reason that the league has a lot of integrity and a lot of a good reputation is that advocacy happens after the league in some form, either on the local level, state level, or national level, has done a study group, 
followed by a consensus meeting and a vote, and then followed by um, adopting a policy, which happens at an annual meeting. So it's a kind of a long process to go from, you know, having some thoughts about something and then creating a policy position that then the league can advocate for. So examples of this would be, you know, abortion. Um, another example would be uh, the old town government was something that was studied arduously and then came, there was a policy position about that Amherst town government. Those are two examples. On the, on the national level, state level and local level, reparations has not been studied even though DEI is this very important lens now that the league is looking at everything through, there has not been this process for, our, for reparations. So because of that, we are limited as a committee for the kind of support that we can give you guys. Um, and the best thing we can do at this point is to offer our support through educational means. And that is another big aspect of the league. Even when there isn't a position paper and advocacy, education is always very much appreciated. So for instance, we invited you to um, participate in our Judy Brooks conversation series early on when you had just been formed as a committee early, I, I, you know, last year sometime. Um, and that was a way to introduce you and your work to the league and to the public, because these are open meetings. Um, the the uh, indicators report that has been mentioned a couple of times is another way that we can get education and, you know, questions out into the into the universe. Um, those are two ideas. And the third is this network that we have been exploring for two years now. And it it's still in, you know, it, it, it's on hi hiatus right now, but it's still a network. And um, we're moving in different directions that we don't, you know, we're, we're in the process of figuring out about the network and how, how that's gonna function. But education is a big way that we can, um, like finding ways that we can support you without writing a letter to the council to approve money for you, for instance, that we couldn't do because of our limitations with the league. Um, the same way that we could do that with CRESS and we could do that with DEI because there are positions about those things. So our hope, and it's a little bit lofty, but our hope is that through Stolen Beam and through education and you know having you come back to Judy Brooks, all these different educational tools that we get league members excited about creating a study group. And possibly we could be, you know, the ones who get this reparations position off the ground for the league on the local level, on the state level. And one kind of cool thing is that these don't have to be hierarchical. Like if we had a position that would we went through the, the process and there was a vote and then we had a, a local chapter uh, position on reparations, other chapters, other leagues could then use ours to create their own. Um, they wouldn't have to go through the whole study group and consensus meeting process. Similarly, you know, it could grow to the state level. So anyway, we hope that more and more education can lead to getting more um, teeth in terms of being able to be supportive uh, regarding reparations locally and nationally. You know, it's a, it's a big deal for the whole, for the whole country, of course. Um, so that's something, you know, we're always sort of asking how can we promote support, help uh, 
committees doing racial work in, in Amherst. And um, that that is something that we hope to have you understand about our limitations and also to know that we are really interested in hearing from you how you feel we could be helpful. Um, so I, I guess that's the little spiel I, I wanted to explain about the league and how it works and why it can be frustrating. Like we, for instance, we will have, um, okay, hopefully <laughs> at, at 3.30 today is the next steering committee of the league, the local league. That's the steering committee meeting. Martha is going to go to the meeting with a, a letter that we all agreed and voted on that will be presented at town council meeting tonight. If the steering committee votes on it, and it, it is a letter that um, is... Um, Oh, I don't know. Someone else might be able to talk more. Ash was the the main person who wrote the letter, so we could we could tell you what that is. But the point is, the the process we have to go through is that we write something, we all agree on it. There are at least ten of us that you know have to kind of have some consensus or at least a majority. Um, and then it goes to the steering committee. They have to vote on it. They have to approve it. And then we have the power to do something public in a meeting. Um, so that, that that's an example of, you know, like some of the hoops we have to go through, which also is part of being part of the league and gives us the benefits of that. Um, I guess, is, is that clear? Did I, I have COVID and so I'm a little <laughs> like, you know, not quite as articulate as I often possibly could be. So anyway, I hope I, I hope that was clear. And I'll I think I'll stop for now. It was very, very clear, Marcy. Thank <laughs> you. Really. COVID brain and all. It was great. <laughs> very helpful. Um, it's really good, I think, for um for our committee to understand that and understand um sort of the process that, you know, uh, the league goes through. And I do hope the steering committee will approve the letter for tonight's meeting. Um, if that, you know, if that's an, another hurdle at the last minute, I know how that feels. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so let's um, just open it up and see if there are, although hang on one second, I just have to count. Okay, we're still okay. I think Dr. Shabazz, may have left the room, um, but we have one, two, three, four, so we're still okay in terms of a quorum. Um, Pamela, will you just keep your eye out on the attendees for Dr. Shabazz? Sometimes he'll leave and end up there. And <laughs> um, So Michelle, I have just, I, I, um, I was blanking on the content of that letter and what it's about actually which isn't reparations related no, but no. it's a, it's about the uh incident that happened with the police and they'll be discussing that tonight and yes. so we have a public statement that we want to make about that yeah but we really you know because we haven't discussed it yet with the with the steering committee you know I I think we really have some obligation not to talk about it sorry to no I was using it as an example of our process yeah. but yeah. not to get into the details yeah Thanks, Martha. Yeah, because uh, we we kind of did it had to do it at the last minute. One of one of our problems is if if something comes up in town or you know something gets raised by one of our committees and so on, we can't just make an immediate statement just because we have to get consensus in our committee and then consensus from the with the steering committee. It makes things a little awkward sometimes when people ask, well, you know, why aren't you, you know, speaking out about this? But you know. We feel that in the long term, having this process that we have to go through is better in the sense that it helps keep us being, you know, impartial and not emotional and, you know, uh, all, but but it does feel awkward sometimes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that's not, yeah, that's all. So, yeah, so we really can't say anything more about the, the letter, I don't think, because of because of that. Yeah.
Yeah. And I, so I saw Meg's hand go up and then I saw Ash's hand go up. So I'll go in that order. Thanks. Um, one of the things you all might think about, which is a light lift and would be to consider joining the league. One of our goals that Marcy didn't mention is trying to diversify the league membership itself. Not so much, not only our committee, but the league. Uh, and it's, you don't have to be on any committees. You can just be a member and it would help when these decisions come up, when membership expresses their opinion in a certain way. Yeah, absolutely. And when Marcy and I had a great conversation, that was one of the things that came up is it's it's it seems like a rather low commitment to join the league. You don't have to get heavily involved, but you can, <laughs> which is nice. I mean, my my own story about that was that I was a paying member for over 10 years and then the dials lined up and uh, Judy Brooks and I co-chaired the voter service uh, department. And then from there, I be actually became president of the league for a year and a half. But mm -hmm. um, my feeling about the league with all of its limitations or, you know, uh, ways that it needs to grow, um, it, it has <laughs> held, it has held the container for democracy in Amherst for all these years. Um, it has been, you know, the, the feeder of information when we had town meeting and uh, all the voter guides, all the, you know, all the ways that um, issues got expressed. And when there were issues that had policies that we, um, that the league had done this work on, you know, we would advocate at town meeting for certain things. So it, it has, always been a really important aspect of democracy in town and um it's also kind of invisible like you see the voter guide in the gazette and you don't know who who wrote it or where it came from or you you know you diff all the different things so uh it's it, it yeah that's a little promotion about about the league itself um and to make it better we have to grow it you know that's that's where we're at yeah Absolutely. Um, Ash, did you want to add to that? Mute. You're muted, Ash. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> the gross <time. laughs> um, But uh, you, you don't have to be uh, a woman to join the League of Women Voters, obviously, since there are a few of us. And so we really encourage men to take a look at it. <laughs> and, uh, but that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say that um, although that process is frustrating because we would like to speak up, uh, at least some of us would, um, that um, I think one of the, the, the ways that the, the league gains some legitimacy is that you have to build the level of unity and support to positions so that you bring together different perspectives and you work it out so that they you come up with a, a, a forward moving statement that creates greater trust and unity. And I think that's very much at least the way I view what the committee can potentially contribute. Um, because obviously as things moves forwards and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different perspectives and, and, and views and emotions and connected to this stuff, it's really rocky and, and thorny. Um, it, it, it's really important to try to find the glue that brings things together um, of, of all populations. So I wanted to say that, but uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I've been very um, enthusiastically personally about the work to address the issues that were identified in that original report on the indicators of racial equity and justice. And, and that is the census and getting better information that can be used to develop a coherent plan for addressing these, uh, not least uh, Yvonne in the area of housing um, and access to capital and equity for housing. And that's, um, I, 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 I'm a firm believer that any real progress is gonna be made because uh, people know what the evidence is about the town, not just the nation, but the town and and, and, uh, and they can actually see some changes in important indicators as things go forward over time. And so um, I hope that 
remains on your agenda as one of the things that is really important in reparations is getting the getting the information that supports the move. Thank you, Ash. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just want to note two two quick observations. Um, so I think the idea that the Amherst League could be the catalyst for a state and national position on reparations is really, really exciting. Um, and I know there are lots of different ways um, that people are thinking about this and still learning about this. Um, and I just wanna say, and of course this committee would wanna discuss this, but um, what an opportunity it could be for us to work together to support each other in that process. If that does become something that the league begins to move toward. Um, and the other thing is in terms of education, um, we did a symposium way back when um, prior to this committee starting up reparations for Amherst did where we uh, presented the research that reparations for Amherst did and uh, also presented some of the research the league had brought forward in the indicators report. And so um, there are opportunities potentially for us to, again, present that information to our community um, and to build on it and, and, and add to it in addition to the work of the stolen beam, which is just fantastic. And, um, and I'm so glad that that's being embraced. So those are my thoughts, um, but I do wanna check in with, um, Ms. Bridges, Dr. Rhodes, Yvonne, Dr. Shabazz, um, Pamela, any other um, comments, um, please just go ahead or raise your hand or any thoughts, brainstorms. Dr. Shabazz, <laughs> oh, I see you for my heart. <laughs> Deep in through the universe. Okay, he's bringing the love. <laughs> Let's go. Um, Dr. Shabazz, did you want to speak? Thank you. I'll I'll keep this uh, brief and keep my video off just because of my connection at this moment. Um, I would like to uh, uh, thank for uh, the group for coming today and for giving us an update um, on uh, where they are and in supporting our work. This is uh this is as you've said. Um, uh, as our chair has said, uh, very, very encouraging. Um, we need, you know, all hands on deck to to move uh, this process forward. Um, certainly, the work at the national level. As I come back from a country that's in a process now of establishing a national reparations commission, mm. uh, you're not at that point, Joe Biden has not moved to by executive order to create a reparations commission, uh, but, in, uh, but in Colombia, they are on their way to being the first nation with a background in slavery and uh, anti-black racism to, to actually proceed to create a national commission that has been uh, uh, governmental support to do the kind of study work to come up with the with a reparative agenda that then in turn can uh, can inform national policy on the basis of the data uh, that that uh, helps us to understand the harms, the inequities, the uh, uh, the disparities. And so I'm I'm uh, as I come back from a country that is uh, is poised to really begin this this process. Uh, I should say there are countries that have gone a long way as well, such as Guyana. And I was with the uh, head of a commission in Guyana. Um, and, uh, and so there, there are other places moving along uh, in the Caribbean and in Latin, Latin America. But, uh, you know, it, it, it infuses me with the sense that a possibility for the USA, if we can actually get, get things moved along. So, you know, work in that regards, work uh, at a national level uh, that that the local league here could stimulate with the, within the national league, you know this is all this is all very good and this is all very uh, very necessary, uh, particularly. But with our local work and as we move to our agenda, you know we're really at a very important place, uh, needing a lot of help, whereby we can begin 
to uh, uh, get a process of registering the uh, uh, the hundreds of, of year-round Amherst residents and in a couple of weeks, uh, also finding ways to reach out to the students that although a more changing uh, population, we still want to have them included in this process. Um, there's, there's a lot of work ahead of us and, uh, and we don't, uh, we're gonna need everything, uh, all wind behind our sails in getting that, getting that work done uh, and, and not, not you know, pursuing other kinds of tangents or other things right now. It's so, uh, and, and we are on a clock you know, to get certain things done by by June of next year. So again, all for what you've uh, uh, for for this update, and and thank you for uh, future work that you will do to support us. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, okay, I see it's two fifty four, and I really look at this as a first conversation as a first opportunity to be together. I really appreciate all of the members who took the time to be here today. Um, so appreciate the connection with Marcy and our, our previous conversation and continuing um, chair to chair to build the unity between our groups and to support one another. Um, and hope that we'll be able to find a time again in the future where, as Dr. Shabazz says, um, once we are a little further along in figuring out what is needed in terms of reaching members of the Black community um, and using that Black census that I think Martha had pointed to, um, that is really something that we're about to discuss actually in this meeting now um, to, to take that information that we that we were able to gather with the Dunahue Institute and begin to get out into the community. So thank you all for being here very, very much. And, um, and we will certainly be in touch and feel free to reach out to us anytime, um, you know, in, in any of our emails, or if you need an email, just let Marcy know and she'll let me know and we'll go I, from I, yeah. I'll, I'll also just quickly say that, um, in addition to COVID, I'm on my way uh, to be leaving Amherst for seven months <laughs> on Friday. And um, I will still obviously be connected to the committee, but Martha Hanner is gonna be um, taking over as chair uh, during my absence. So there's definitely ways to reach us either through me or through um, Martha and Michelle has our email addresses and you, you know how to find us, you all pretty much. <laughs> Yvonne, we're Facebook friends. So worst case, you, you, can, you can message me on Facebook. <laughs> yes. Thank well, you very lots much. Lots of friendship uh, here. <laughs> thanks very much for, um, for having us. It means a lot. Absolutely. Same to us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right. Wonderful. So um, I think we should just do a quick check in here in terms of timing. Um, I um, am gonna call for public comment just to make sure we get that done. And then I would like for us to be able to continue until 3.30, are folks available to do that today? Yeah, okay, I see. I, can. I might need to step away for a minute, but um, yeah. Okay. Dr. Rhodes and Dr. Shabazz and Ms. Bridges, how does that work for you? Yes. I, I just have to step away for about five minutes and then I'll come right back. That's okay. In about, I can do it in about 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I'll be right back. Okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just call for public comment now so that we make sure we don't um, miss that. So if anybody would like to make public comment that's in the audience, please raise your hand now. Um, during the public comment period, I will recognize members of the public. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your name, pronouns, and residential address. You're welcome to express your views up to three minutes and we will not engage, but we will be listening closely. So please, um, if you would like to make public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand now and I will bring you into the room. I'm gonna turn my camera off for one second so I can get my charger, but um, public comment is open.
Okay, I am not seeing any hands. So I am going to um, end the public comment period. And now, finally, after <laughs> many, many weeks of um, wanting to begin this discussion of community engagement, and I think Dr. Shabazz actually really, um, in his comments with the league, sort of laid the foundation right there really of what is ahead of us. Um, and I really wanted to in, uh, sort of, instead of coming with something laid out or, you know, some proposal from my, and I just wanted to open this time up for discussion um, to see what folks were thinking about embarking on this process of getting out into the community and beginning to really engage members of the Black community in particular. So if you have comments on this, please raise your hand and we'll get the conversation going. Yes, Dr. Rhodes. You know, obviously, it's really, really important that we move down the road with this project uh, really quickly in a meaningful way. Uh, one of the thoughts that I have was that, you know, there, when we say engage the community, uh, we, we, what we do know is that we do know where African Americans and Amherst live. Not specifically, but in certain sections of town, sectionally, we know, and we know the numbers. So the, the task becomes, well, how do you then reach out to those numbers and engage them? And, and, and so for me, the question is, all right, we have used the Donahue Institute uh, uh, successfully, and, and they have specific kind of skills, I would like to see a survey of the African-American community done by the Donahue Institute or anyone else. But I assume the Don Donahue Institute, mainly because we, A, we know them, they have work, work for us, and we know that what their skill set is. So I would like to see a survey. And there, you know, there are several and I don't want a server that has 20 questions on it. You know, I want a server that has at most five questions. At most. Um, and, and we need to move on that in an expeditious manner to get, the, get that information as soon as possible. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Um, and before I go to Dr. Shabazz and Yvonne, I'm going to um, go to Pamela. So uh, actually you're welcome to go to Dr. Shabazz and uh, to Yvonne first. My comment is in reference to the survey. So you might wanna hear from everyone before you come to me. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. And if you ever, I know last time there was just a question about a, a note that you missed or something. So just just talk if that happens. <laughs> okay, Dr. Shabazz. Yvonne, rather, Yvonne, I, I welcome you to go ahead. Yvonne? Yes. So um, engagement tactics are like um, many folds. Um, surveys are, I think there are lots of multiple ways that we can get at what we need. I mean, the big goal is to engage as many people of color as we can, but also to engage the whole community so that we have partners that will spread the news and the information farther and wider than we can. Um, and those are our allies and others in other groups, businesses in the community. So person to person is Per, is great um, doing surveys, I think is certainly one way of getting at people. 
The other are these partnerships um, that would be with town committees like the one we invited. It could be town committees. It could be town departments. It can also be nonprofits in the region um, uh, as well as I think the big one are businesses. I think that that really reaching out to businesses, not just black businesses, but businesses in general, that will go a long way to getting more than a small group of people understanding and knowing what our committee is about. So some of this is promo for what we're doing. Like it gets the word out about what we're doing. So we get more people who can spread the word. Um, the, the sticky part is that our message has to be very clear. And I think we need to, we need to work on what that clear message is when we're starting to reach out to people and then the last way is for us to sponsor our own special events. So if we do uh, potluck dinners, if we do a concert that's under our name or partnered with someone else, um, if we, you know, uh, uh, talk to um, the business improvement district, if they're doing festivals or things outside, we have a table. You know, the, that kind of stuff also goes a long way. So I guess I'm mapping it out because I feel like there's multiple ways of doing this. And I think we should um, enlist all of these ways. It just means us as a committee um, being clear about these different ways and um, portioning out the work, the tasks. You know, so I think that, that it, basically we should come up with a plan for all of this. Mm -hmm. Yes, a plan. <laughs> yes. I'm sure, I'm sure I missed something and other folks should chime in. But no, I just, that was I just really... quickly wrote a list of like, if I were doing it, what would I do? And those are all the things that I would do. Yeah. Yes. And I'm taking notes. <laughs> I, can, I can email you the, the I mean, there's just two, three big areas that, yeah. uh, that probably have subcategories. Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. Okay. Dr. Shabazz. Okay, thank you. Um, so here's what I want to add a little bit new, and I agree with everything that's been uh, raised thus far. Um, but I'd like to suggest, and if the, there's a consensus here, I would be happy to work with uh, with the chair and with folks in the in the town, perhaps uh, Brianna Sunrid or, or or whomever. But I like to ask people's thoughts here uh, about an online registration portal. This, is, this would ask only a, a small set of questions uh, in deference to what Dr. Rhodes was saying earlier, but essentially um, to the, the contact information for those that would register of their name, of, their, uh, of different addresses, ground address, physical address in Amherst, email address, uh, uh, cell phone contact if they wish to share that. And, and then the basic question of uh, that they identify as an Amherst resident of African heritage, of African descent. Uh, it could allow information below that to sort of, you know, with maybe two additional questions. How long have you resided in Amherst? And secondly, you know, anything else about your um, specific characteristics of your ethnic heritage, of your African heritage um, uh, in the U.S. for so many generations from outside the U.S., Cape Verde, Jamaica, uh, Trinidad, Colombia, all these places come to mind. But basically where you could further uh, delineate aspects of your, your African uh, heritage but then basically that becomes the, uh, the portal for individuals in town to uh, self-identify as being of African heritage and wishing to be informed and registered in this community process. Um, this could be done through, uh, through a town of Amherst website I, this is what I'd like to, if, if there's agreement to this, explore with town staff how we might set this up, how this would be managed. I can tell you in relation to Evanston, um, the data gets, you know, would be stored uh, 
and have the actual reported information of name, address, identification as African, a black African American or of African heritage. And, but then in terms of any sharing out, this would then be shared out with a, with a, with a alphanumeric uh, 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 indication. And so a person's name would never be shared as, as part of any list in terms of public records request or anything of that sort, all that would be shared is, is characteristics of the database perhaps in terms of we have 400 people that have registered uh, that are over that are 18 or over and, um, uh, and, and then only say this alphanumeric code. If you ever look up uh, Evanston in what they call their ancestors uh, database of, 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 of Evanston residents who are of African heritage, it gets put in this Excel spreadsheet that does not record their names, but only these alphanumeric um, uh, codes that then, of course, for those who are um, uh, delegated or designated to have access to that information, uh, uh, such as the ongoing reparations commission, they would have that, but again, from public records requests or just to the general public, no one would have access to that registration list, only to the alphanumeric codes. Um, I think this is a way in which people can take the step of coming to us, of coming into this process, and for the future reparations commission that spins off uh, following the conclusion of our work, this would be the way in which they would have an engaged uh, uh, portal, uh, a portal of engagement that would register all those that, that seek to, uh, to self-identify. Um, and if you are familiar with um, the, uh, for example, the, the Darity uh, uh, Mullen work, they talked about how at the start of a national level uh, um, uh, program that, you know, this, you would make that declaration, I am of Africa, I am black African American, and you'd have to prove it within 12 years of the start of the reparations program. Going 12 years back, you have to offer proof that you identify. Well, this registration at a local level could be part of that as a way in which someone said in, say, 2022, I am, at, I am designating this is how I identify. And uh, that could even be offered as part of the, the effort to prove um, uh, African ancestry, African American-ness uh, at the start of a federal reparations program. So again, these things sort of fit in hand in glove, but, but that's my, my proposal of an additional step that we can take. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. That is a fantastic idea. Um, so I see um, Ms. Bridges' hands up. So I'll go to Ms. Bridges and then I'll come back to you, Pamela. Uh, I think you answered my question afterwards because I was going to ask um, how with the reparations going and, and we weren't going to individualize certain things. So I just wanted to kind of clear that up if if you're doing individual registration. How how does that work? And some people, you know, don't want to do that. I've spoken to people in different states that, you know, they propose that. And some people are kind of leery about it because, you know, prove it how anybody could do that or and with here, you know, people, who has this information about us? You know, um, some, some kids or younger kids, they may be 18 and they may know what they are, but can't go back and prove it and don't have the information. Um, I was speaking to someone from Amherst College and they were saying pretty much the same thing that their students want to know their heritage and there's a lot of her students that just can't get there and don't have that information anymore so but i think he he kind of answered the question but i'm still kind of eh, about it 
<laughs> I think that is an, an, an open question that we need to explore within this concept. Absolutely. Um, so I'm assuming, or I maybe I'm wrong to assume Dr. Shabazz, but I think maybe you wanted to respond to Ms. Bridges. So um, if, oh, your hand is down now. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, Yvonne, would you mind if I go to Pamela? Um, her hand's been up a while and then we'll come back. Okay, great. Pamela. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to um, point out a couple of things for the uh, assembly to think about as you continue to make plans for how you would gather information. And that is that there are at least three other boards in the town that are also going to be reaching out to communities of color around certain issues, um, uh, the Human Rights Commission, the CSS Jake um, Board, especially in regards to the Residents Oversight Board, the creation of that. And so uh, I, I think it's very important that we have a coordinated effort, um, even though these are sort of distinct uh, sort of inquiries that you're gonna make, I, I would hate to see survey fatigue impact the information that's gathered from any of the boards. So I think it's uh, a great idea to reach out to Brianna and think about ways in which we might coordinate the gathering of, of this information. And I also agree with, uh, with Yvonne that we're gonna need multiple ways of gathering information and engaging. Um, engaging residents. So just as, as you're continuing to have your discussions, please keep in mind that there are going to be multiple boards uh, who are also going to seek to do community engagement with the same population. Yeah, absolutely. That, I think that's really critical that we, we think about that and think holistically um, about this um, because even in addition to those, there are other surveys out there that may have some crossover, you know? So um, yes, Yvonne, and then uh, Dr. Rhodes. So I'd love to uh, sort of add to what Pamela said right now, which is that, um, again, um, I typed up those things that I said before, and I'll email it to you, Michelle. I don't know if I should email it, email it to everybody, email it to you so we could keep it as a list to refer to. But yeah, I, I, I know to me and Pamela and Jennifer, and then okay. we'll make sure it gets to everybody. Okay, yeah. okay. So um, going to what you just said, Pamela, the, the uniqueness of how we touch people will make it so that we can, can get the information we need. So mm -hmm. if we get clump, you're right about coordinating the effort but also using two or three different ways to get at the survey, like the survey, I feel like the survey may not be the first pass at us getting at people. Cause like you said, people get survey fatigue. Um, so maybe the first pass or the, this is a strategy that we create where the first pass is really a more unique and personal way to reach at people. So like I said, we throw an event and we invite people to come. We have dinner with them, mm -hmm. right? We do something that's social that people will remember so that they, when we, when we do say, oh, you're going to get this survey in your email, or you're going to get, you know, you're going to have to do an online registration, then folks will be like, oh, I'll look for that. And then they will fill it out. So it, it would be like, if they get three um, surveys in the mail, and one of them is from us, and we had dinner with them, they're going to fill ours out. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> or swag. People like swag. Absolutely. People like swag. So if we make if we make caps or something and we make pens and we hand stuff out to people and then we tell them later on, watch for the survey. If they get three, like I said, if they get three in the mail and one of them's ours, they're gonna fill ours out first. All right. So that there are strategies for how to get people to, you know, actually, you know, it's great to coordinate the effort. We should. But I think we also want to go the extra step and make some really um, more personal connections with people as much as we can to get as many people involved to participate. Um, the, the one part I think we need to talk about maybe later, um, Dr. Shabazz uh, talked about uh, an online registration. And I think that that is about getting people to know that they will benefit from registration. The benefit is you will register and there might be something that you get back because you register. 
So people will register if they know they're going to get a housing subsidy or a lunch subsidy. You know what I mean? If they're gonna, if they feel like they're going to get something, they'll register. But my question is the first question I'm sure people will ask me is, do I have to be a current Amherst resident to be able to register? Cause there's folks, you know, who have lived here 20 years and then they move to New York. Right. But you know, they've lived here for, you know, so I think that uh, even more like, like what I said before about being accurate with our information, we need to figure out what, what is accurate about who's eligible. Mm-hmm. Who are we asking to register? Are they folks who are still living in Amherst? They, maybe they have a family home here. There are people who have lived, like you said, 20 or 30 years, and now they live in DC or something. Are they not eligible? Mm-hmm. Are family members eligible? So let's say, you know, I, I still live in Amherst, right? But my son lives in New York City, but he came up through the Amherst school system his whole life. So is he eligible? Right. So though I think those are the, the gray areas that we need to really talk about, because what, what could happen is someone says, well, I'm eligible because I think so. Right. <laughs> and they register, but they're actually not really eligible. Then that's bad. Uh, you know, that's bad blood. You know, like that gives people a, you know, that that creates negative promo, like negative energy. And we don't want any of the negative energy. So we want to, again, be really clear about everything from the get go especially since we're reaching out to people. We, we need to be really clear about that. So I think we want to do that first. Yeah, absolutely. I think creating parameters for the registration is really, really important. Um, and I just quickly want to add before I go on Dr. Rhodes and Dr. Shabazz that when I spoke with Kerry Spitzer at the Dunahue Institute who helped us with the Black Census, Um, She had made an identical suggestion to what Pamela is making um, in, I'll add that the Board of Health was also trying to reach out to residents of color. And so there was the Board of Health, there was the Human Rights Commission, there's now the new um, committee, so, and, and then ourselves. So if there is a way to coordinate where there's one survey that has a couple questions for each of those areas. That's a strategy. And I also agree though, with what Ivana is saying in that the uniqueness of the way that we are reaching people and touching people. And so at the end, I'll sort of recap what I have in mind, but let's go to uh, Dr. Rhodes and then Dr. Shabazz. You know, you know, what is, what is important to me is that information we get, should be very valuable information. And it should be credible information. And it should be representative information. And that last word, representative. I I, I think that when one does a survey and you do it in a non-representative way, when you get answers, it only reflects the answers of those people who, who took the survey. All right, it doesn't represent the community. So I'm really all for a representative, randomized sample of African-Americans in Amherst. I'm I'm not for just a general survey that goes out to all African-Americans. And then what we get back are the answers for those people who, uh, and and their answers are only representative of them. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, and that doesn't do us any good. So, so one part survey, I really want a representative survey of all African Americans, representative randomized survey in relationship to rep, uh, reparations. The same for the general population because we need to know how they feel and what their thoughts are about rep- reparations. So those are two things that are really, really important to me. And if you, people want, want to understand where I come from, I come from a quantitative, a back, quantitative research background. That's what I believe in. That's what my training is. Uh, and it doesn't mean that a qualitative study isn't, uh, is, isn't valuable. In some ways, they are really, really valuable. And some people do both. Uh, but, uh, and for me, the strength of a quantitative, randomized representative uh, survey is something that will benefit, benefit this group 
the most. So I would be strongly uh, arguing for that. Thanks, Dr. Rhodes. And when I spoke to Carrie, we talked about a representative um, randomized uh, survey, as you as you stated, and it is a challenge. Um, and I'm wondering if this group would be interested. Um, by the way, I did invite Brianna to our meeting today, but she's on vacation. So I'm going to extend the invite for our next meeting or um, perhaps uh, Dr. Shabazz and myself and Pamela and Jennifer can get together with her um, and, and have a conversation um, and then bring that information back to the group so that it's a little bit more formulated. Um, oh, but I just, I don't understand. Uh, what are you gonna be talking to Brianna about or with or? Yeah, um, so let me, I'm sorry, I'm jumping a little bit. I just, I wanna address what you said about um, the, the representative randomized survey and wondering if you would like for me to invite Carrie um, to which she has been, she has offered herself time and time again um, to come to an, our next meeting if possible to talk to us about what something like that would take Dr. Rhodes um, and how we might go about that. If she's willing to come to the meeting and spend some time with us, would this committee be open to having her as a guest to do that? Here's, here's a, we have a lot of work to do. Yep. And, 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 and if we continue to use our meetings to exactly. uh, have other people come and talk to us, then we're wasting valuable time. Yeah. It would be better if we had a subcommittee of people who want to do that, sit down with Carrie, yeah. get her thoughts and information on that, and then bring it back to this committee. And that yeah. would make it a, a more efficient and effective use of our time. I totally agree with you. That's sort of what I was saying about Brianna. Um, would D Dr. Rhodes, do you want to be that? Would you be willing to be that person to reach out to Carrie to have that conversation? Oh, def most definitely. Okay, that would be fantastic. And then, um, and then, you know, once you've made contact with her, if you feel like you'll be able to bring it back in time for our next meeting, um, you'll let me know so I can uh, create the agenda accordingly. And then what I was suggesting with Brianna is that Dr. Shabazz would be the lead on that one. Um, and I can be helpful there too, um, with Pamela and Jennifer and Brianna to, um, talk about setting up what what is it going to take to set up an engage Amherst page that could include a registration portal that could include a survey that could include advertisements for an event all of the things that we've been talking about um, so if there's no opposition to that I would like for us to um, to move forward with that in between meetings as well I'm just going to interject and remind um, that if the subcommittee would uh, constitutes a quorum, then you have to uh, abide by the open meeting laws. So, you know, this working group has to be small in number so that they can um, can work together and then bring the information back. Yes, the reminder we don't we don't like to hear, but we need. <laughs> um, and so I think we'll be okay if Dr. Rhodes is on his own with Carrie. They have a long-standing relationship. Um, I think if it's just Dr. Shabazz and myself meeting with Brianna, and then of course, um, if somebody else wants to participate in any of, of either of those things, and there's going to be more and. I, I actually have something um, that I need to present to the committee today, if possible, that Paul has brought to my attention, but I'm going to go, um, Dr. Shabazz had his hand up, and then Yvonne, your hand is still up, is that, okay, so let's go to you, Dr. Shabazz. Very good, so again, I want to reiterate that, that my idea is not a survey, my idea is an opportunity for the community, the African heritage community, to reach in to this work and into this process as opposed to us reaching out to them. 
So I think we got to do both. We have to have the the outreach work with the events, with the uh, uh, mailers, the different strategies we're talking about here. But I think that if we embrace this portal idea, it's a way they can reach in and actually register and say, keep me informed. I want to be a part of this process. I want to weigh in. And then down the line, we can then, you know, judiciously find opportunities to survey that group. And then the integrity of that uh, position will be based upon the actual numbers of those that have that have registered and, and, and sought to become a part of this community process. If we get 400 uh, 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 older, 18 years and older of, of Amherst residents, and here I'm not talking about you know, the, the Jeff Goldblums, who, who, Jeffs who live right across the line in Pelham. I'm not talking about the people who grew up here, but now they're living in New York. I'm talking about those who are living, paying taxes, are, are registered to vote, that are a part of Amherst right here, right now. I have been saying if we get to 400, that to me blows away any randomized sample. That's going to be a really strong representative number of the total, okay? When you break down what we learned already from uh, uh, the, the, the work we had uh, uh, on the census, that's a very powerful number when you, uh, uh, when you talk about 3,400 or so uh, in 2020 identified as African-American more than half of that was students, students who probably, uh, all those who have graduated and gone. And then, um, uh, and it's a totally different set of numbers that, that are there now. And then when you take out those that are under 18, um, you really get to a very small number of actual African uh, descendant uh, Amherst residents. And that's not a problem, but we have to understand um, I, I add this to the question of the surveying piece. Um, uh, our chair and myself, uh, we've talked with a, um, an expert at this work at the University of Massachusetts, Dr. Tatesh Inteta. And he actually has already been doing uh, political surveys, polling on reparations in Massachusetts in uh, and analyzing basically from a, uh, um, a, a a group that does this work, and they buy they buy the the work from them. So they already have this randomized pool. They don't have it down to the level of Amherst because of the size of Amherst. They have it on a regional uh, level of Western Mass. They can do, and they have the state, but they do not have it down to this company that they buy. Uh, uh, survey data from. They do not have it down to the Amherst level because of, of, of statistical problems of size, okay? But uh, we talked to them about whether it is possible, how it is possible to try and actually get at a survey of a town this size for the town overall, as well as for the African-American part of, of the town. And there are some immense challenges you can throw out terms like random sample, but to actually then do it, there are real problems for status for for this kind of statistical work with a population this uh, 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 this small. But I just wanted to put that out there to say that's some of the challenge we're going to face on this. Um, but the the portal piece is different from the question of survey. The portal is about having member residents of Amherst. Who, who explicitly state and that they this is how they identify and ask to be a part of this process. And yes, what kind of things can they get in return? They can get information about specific health issues from our health board related to disparities relevant to, to African-Americans. They can get things about housing. They can get things about education, uh, uh, crime, uh, crime and criminal justice, the different harm areas by registering in the process. But we can talk more about how to, to spin this as we reach 
you know, share the portal within the community. But this is how uh, uh, th this is what I'm suggesting as a way that we actually offer the community to self-identify and to engage with us in this process. Thank you. Yeah, and, and having that black census and being able to send a, a postcard out into those areas of the community asking for people to register if they wish. Um, so we can do an in and reach out, reach in, you know, kind of thing. Um, Dr. Rhodes and then yeah. Elon. So anyway, a mail card, Dr. Chavez, getting 400 people of black folks and Amherst registered, that is a good number. Uh, and it's not representative, it's just that there are 400 people. It is possible, if we have those 400 people, to do a randomized representative sample of that 400. We can do that. That's a, that's a whole different thing. Uh, and, and, and that's something that can be done. I mean, it would be beautiful to get 400 African Americans uh, uh, in town who are on that, that portal. That would be wonderful. And, that, and from that, that is a database in which all kinds of information can, uh, can be gotten uh, from that group. Uh, again, for me, if there are 400 uh, African-Americans who are, who, are, who, are, who are registered and uh, we want to survey that group, you can randomize the sample on that. You don't have to sample all of it. Have to, have to ask the question to all of them. You could just do a randomized sample that for up to 400. Anyway, Correct. the challenges, the challenges of doing that. And the, yeah, by the way, the, the, there's the at University of Massachusetts. There used to be a uh, social and demographic research organization at, at, out of the uh, sociology department. Uh, and uh, my great friend, who has now passed away, Dr. Wright, led that. And and I work with that group and they, their specialty was surveying populations of small towns. And they had this, and, and so the techniques, the ability to do that is there, obviously if it wasn't, a, if the ability wasn't there to do that and turn and without the, you know, people say there are all these challenges. What challenges are there to doing a representative sample of Amherst? I mean, my God, if there were, it's possible. I mean, there, it's I possible. The group, the group we're talking to is out of going is out. out of political science, uh, and that's Ray Laraja and Tatesh and Teta, and um, yeah, it's possible. I'm just saying that, but there there are challenges into in terms of how you do it right. Yeah, yeah, but but you know, all I'm saying is the techniques, the methodologies, they're proven. They've been done over and over again throughout this country, uh, all over the place, every day. And it can be done. And so one of the things, Dr. Rhodes, if you could speak with Carrie about, um, I think if I'm remembering our conversation, it was actually, it, it was it was really came down to the economics of doing it and the cost to do it the way that you're suggesting is going to be uh, at a higher cost, of course, than to do it uh, just a, you know, so we'll have to weigh that when we think about, um, you know what we're doing here and so um yvonne is your hand up now for yeah um, <laughs> okay I, I i i guess i have a question and a comment i i feel like uh, what um dr shabazz has suggested is a wonderful first effort for us that we get started with it right away because if we get those 400 people then we have a really great beginning right yeah. so i don't know how we can get started with that there are some things that i know need to be taken care of which is like where this portal how it would get put together what questions would where does the data live you know the maintenance of the site itself or the or the surveys do we do some research on you know to make sure that everyone who's registered is legit you know, for lack of a better word, make sure that, you know, that, that, the, that we can actually review and maybe do a little bit of research on the data, whatever we collect. Um, so I think that, you know, if there's going to be an expense or if there is going to be an investment of time, this seems to me like it's a really great one to start with. And mm -hmm. I think at the next meeting, maybe we want to talk about it, you know, flesh it out a little bit more so that we can move ahead with it quickly. I think I think this is one thing that's it's a no-brainer. It's not. I don't think it's going to be as difficult 
to get it started. And, and it's a good first start, a good first effort. Yeah. Absolutely. And we will, what's that Dr. Rhodes? So I said, I said, I have, I have to leave. Okay. And, and one, one thing, Mil, Dr. Dr. Chavez and Yvonne, that portal, getting portal information, one of the things that we need to do when we do that is market that portal. Because if we don't market absolutely. it, it'll never be used. See y'all later. Dr. Rhodes, can you stay yes, for 30 absolutely. more seconds? Can I just, I want you to hear this. Can you stay right. for 30 more seconds? I'm planting a seed for our next uh, our next discussion. Um, and I, I agree with what you just said. And Dr. Shabazz and I will get some information from Brianna on that. But what I wanted to tell you is that I spoke with Paul after our last meeting. And um, Paul expressed that there were folks in the community um, who wanted, uh, I think, folks that would not identify as people of color um, that have thoughts about you know, whether or not we should be doing this, how the money's being spent. There's a school project, there's all sorts of other things going on. And what I want to ask this committee, and this is not to answer for now, is where are we in the process of taking in feedback from members of the community that do not identify as people of color? And do we have thoughts about whether that should uh, occur anonymously? How do we want to handle those sorts of um, those sorts of pieces of feedback that are starting to sort of bubble up, um, but that there isn't a channel by which this committee has set up for that to happen? Um, so we don't have to answer it. I'm just planting the seed now for us to think about. Um, I, I feel very strongly personally that we need to focus on reaching the Black community right now and um, focusing all of our efforts. And we have an email address if people want to reach out, but it's about uh, you know, so let's let let me stop there. But I've planted the seed, and we'll talk I more. I think we should create a statement and then um, uh, send that out. But I think we should talk about that at the next meeting. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. That's what I think. I think it's e easy. I don't think it's drama, because my initial reaction was it's none of their business. But actually, <laughs> I pulled that back and said, yeah, I think information is good to share and having that information out there is what we should do. So I think next meeting we should talk about that. Okay, I'll definitely, add that to our agenda. And definitely uh, to talk about it because the uh, chatter that's going around town about reparations, we have to hear that and yes. formalize the ways of hearing it. Yeah, and yes. It's not just from African-Americans, but from the other yes. sections of the community. We, we, we have to do that yeah. ASAP. Thank you all. See yes. You. Thank you, yes. Dr. Rhodes. Yep. Thank you. All right, so we are going to fall under a quorum here, so we really can't <laughs> yeah. continue anyway. Um, yes. So I'm going to just uh, hope uh, I will send out an email. I'd like for us to meet next week again at this. Actually, I don't know if I can meet next week at this time. Let me send an email with some times for everybody to respond to, okay? Um, since we have Hala and uh, Yvonne, you, it looks like you might have something to add. I'm not sure. No, no, I'm just looking at okay. my calendar and I agree I might not. I don't know if I'm going to be available, but we can try it for next week. Okay, I'll send an email and we'll figure something out. Um, and I thank everybody if there aren't any other comments. Um, thank you, Pamela, for being here. And uh, thanks to everyone. And I will, let me just see what time it is. I'm going to call the meeting closed at 3.41 p.m. And Great. thank you. Thank Good to you. see you. Good meeting. <laughs> Bye. Bye.